Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome again to another Fluid Webinar Series event. Today, we're going to be talking about Solo Mo, which is social, local, mobile, and uh, kind of the idea of the conventional media and how it's adapting and how it's getting a little bit more close to home as things uh, start to change. Um, as usual, we are live on Facebook, and so for any of those listening to the webinar that would like to join us, you can go to our Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash getfluid and uh, watch us actually do this live today. And so let's go ahead and jump into it. We're excited to... Um, we're excited to have our guest, Faith Alder, here, and uh, I'll let her introduce herself in just a minute, but I wanted to quickly just tell you guys who I am. As usual, I am your host. My name is Dustin Cedarholm. I am the Digital Marketing Director for Fluid Advertising, and uh, usually we would have Phil Case, who is a Marketing Director and Partner, partner for Fluid, Fluid Joints, but he is out uh, on this one. But uh, I think with Faith Alder and myself, we're going to take very good care of you. So um, Faith Alder actually comes from us from KUER uh, 90.1 in Salt Lake City, Utah. She's an underwriting associate and uh, really thought it was appropriate because of a, KUR, KUER's presence in the community, and then just uh, radio being such a big part of the uh, solo mo uh, kind of environment. And so, hey, do you mind uh, just introducing yourself and giving us a little background today? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Faith Alder. I am the newest underwriting associate at uh, KUER. We are Utah's public radio station, so we are statewide. There are other public radio stations throughout the state, but we do happen to be the one that is uh, statewide and available all over the Wasatch Range. So um, there we work with companies in a little bit of a different way than a commercial station does, um, but we are able to do a lot of different things, um, either through trade, through actual spots on the air, um, sponsorship of different shows, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, in, in reference to Solo Mo, like we've, We've had to come. We've had to make some changes in the way that we do things, and we've had to kind of move forward from just simply advertising on on the station. And so, I think it's a good opportunity for us to talk today about some of the changes we've made, but also some of the ways that radio um, can be a part of of what's going on in this industry as well. So yeah, it's uh, interesting just having the elections occur, and you know how much does local radio help, you know, the candidates and get the word out and spread yeah. different, um, you know, propositions that might be out and just really getting information out. And that's something that radio does so well, especially at the local level. Right. And then how does that turn into a digital presence and all the other things that come with it? Sure. So we'll go ahead and expand upon that a little bit more. Before I do, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, as usual, you guys can reach us on uh, Twitter via the hashtag Fluid Webinar Series. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to add that to your comments, and uh, we will uh, respond to them, or uh, just thank you for engaging with this presentation. Uh, if you do want to actually direct messages, you can use any of the at symbols below, so at GetFluid and at Faith Alder for our profiles, and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. We will also be live tweeting throughout the event if you want to follow on Twitter uh, for some of the best quotes and facts that come from the presentation. So uh, feel free to do that as well. Um, so let's just go ahead and get started. Sure. And I think for most people out there, the most important thing that we could probably do is just define what social, local, mobile, and or solo mo really is. And so as it's probably fairly apparent, uh, solo mo is actually a amalgamation of the words social, local, and mobile. And what it really represents is the improvement and um, changes as far as technology really had in our ability to use um, apps and the data that they provide. And because there are so many social considered apps, and a lot of people think social, they'll immediately think Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. But if you look below, like um, Foursquare, Groupon, Kayak, in a way, they all are social channels in and of themselves. And so um, I think that Groupon is one of the best social um, sites that we actually have um, that people really forget, but that is so solo mo in the fact that it's a social app, it's a local uh, coupon program, and it's all based off of your phone and where you are um, as far as where your current location is. And so that's kind of uh, 
in a way, the solo mo technology definition and kind of when people say solo mo, what they're trying to do is use apps to generate traffic and then use the tracking of it to define conversions. Right. Um, any other thoughts on just kind of the traditional definition of solo mo? No, I mean, I think, I mean, I think it'll be interesting for Groupon as they move forward as we seen them kind of move into trying to do things nationally mm -hmm. where that gets them and what that does for them but you know starting as like the original solo mo I mean Groupon was it and so seeing even the changes that they've made throughout what that means to them will be will be interesting to watch mm -hmm. absolutely um, so Part of the reason we actually wanted to do this today is because we have our own definition and, and I have a little bit different theory about solo mo. I like the acronym solo mo, but I don't necessarily think that the traditional sense of using apps is something that every business can use all the time. And so when I think of solo mo, I actually kind of came up with my own definition, but really it's just the consideration of user behavior on different devices primarily mobile, and the fact that most people are spending most of their time on a social network, and so how do brands reach them there? And then the simple fact that most people buy within three miles of their house, and so everybody's really local. We're all, you know, I mean, every one of us is going to the store and purchasing within our own area. Um, and so I think that we don't often consider that enough when we're a small, medium-sized business or retail location. We think of them kind of in silos. How's your social media going? But you don't think to put, you know, location indicators, like put an address in some of your posts so people can simply click it and get directions directly from there. And obviously they're going to be accessing it from the mobile device. So make sure that, you know, the comments that you are making are, you know, shorter or at least kind of mobile centric in the idea that we don't want to read an entire book on our phone. And so can you make these strategies just thinking about the idea of this a little bit smaller network, but putting them all together rather than leaving them in one section. Um, any other just thoughts how radio's done it? Well, I think for us, I, mean, I, I like the undef undefinition better than the formal definition for, for us, for KUER, right. just in the idea, obviously, that local concept is, and, and for public radio in general, the, the local concept is, is huge because, you know, our listeners are very, very passionate about public radio and they're, um, and they honestly, I mean, we've done a lot of research that shows that our listeners are more, are 60% more likely to go to a business that supports public radio. They feel like they're, and, you know, with, when you've got those local companies, and so having these people, but then the adaptation, you know, bringing in an app, that was big for us. You know, we didn't have an app for a long time, and I'll be honest, for a long time, I only listened, I streamed it off of my desktop because I was at work in front of the computer all day. And so, you know, now understanding that we have 160,000 people every month that view the app and that that's a, that is something that can be a resource for us has been, you know, it's been kind of a shift for us and we're all getting used to it, but, yeah. you know, it's I, I love the undefinition. Well, and even with uh, the radio example and with your uh, app specifically, you know, for me, I'm driving up from Salt Lake to Bountiful, right. and in some of the public radio stations, actually, I kind of lose. It gets a little bit spotty. Mm -hmm. um, I'll use the app to listen to podcasts of my favorite shows, sure. and you know whether you have the uh, a good signal or not, you can just be picking the shows you really want. And I think that also kind of expands the concept of mobile. Right. I mean, I'm now in my car. I could listen to the live radio and the current program programming, but I also have the entire station with me right? Yeah, in my phone, and I can just podcast whatever I want, and then those still come with specific ads or, you know, any underwriting that might be involved in them as right. well, and so you're still reaching those types of things. Yeah, so. and like I said, I think that's why your undefinition maybe is a little bit better than, well, in our purposes, and, but it, it speaks to more of what it's become. Yeah, and just for those of you guys out there, that's kind of, we want to represent that today because we do feel that it's more applicable for the audience that is listening. Mm -hmm. We definitely think as you mature and it, where you have budget and it's right for you, an app is a great way to go, and, you know, right. as they just said, it, it has done wonders for them. So mm -hmm. um, I think you just kind of have to establish where are you in your current marketing maturity um, with your business? Yeah, is it even, again, applicable? Do you do you need an app? I mean, don't just get an app to have an app because what's right. that, you know, really going to do for you? And that's why I kind of wanted to start this conversation because this, to me, is at least the planning that leads into the app. 
sure. when you're talking about, hey, do I actually need an app? Why don't you start with a social, local, mobile kind of campaign right. and see how people react to it? Maybe that'll tell you if you should dedicate more funds into it. Mm -hmm. so, um, just real quickly, wanted to talk a little bit about how all this has come to be because solo mo um, kind of was a term that began in about 2010, got a little bit of uh, loved in 2013 and it has pretty much died ever since. It's, there's not a lot being put out about it. And, um, and I think that's because it was probably a little bit premature with the app and the ability to connect everything. And now in 2016, I actually think it's gotten easier. The technologies are getting better and it really has um, brought this concept at least up to me because all I do is I sit and listen about how important your mobile is. I mean, everybody sitting here, you've all got one in your pocket right now. Uh, everybody's holding that phone, every kid is holding their phone. Everywhere you go, you're Googling something to get a better price or a comparison or to make sure the reviews match. And so it right now the phone has just blown up so much that I really think that we just need to be thinking about that. And then the fact that people spend so much time on social media, um, again, it's just part of the way technologies have changed, and that's not even Facebook, but what Snapchat has done, what YouTube has done, becoming the second largest search engine. Um, I mean, most millennials are using, I think it's like 34% of millennials use their phones solely to stream video. I mean, that is a lot of video watching, and, <laughs> and, some, and so we'll get into some of that stuff, but I wanted to go directly into each of the channels and how I at least believe that they have changed um, and what the technologies have brought them to to make this conversation um, valid at this time. Right. Um, so quickly just touching on the social media aspect of it. Uh, again, almost 80% of the time on mobile devices is spent on social media sites. So that's an app right there. You can serve an ad into that. And so you have a uh, local and mobile um, opportunity because everybody is spending so much time on those apps, even if you don't already have your own app. Um, uh, another kind of misnomer is that organic campaigns often outperform paid campaigns for local e-com and brick and mortar retail shops. And so it's just incredible. I mean, people sharing reviews, user generated engagement will do so much more for you than doing the paid model. Um, and I've seen that almost across the board in every client I've ever seen. It's funny because I, um, my, my friend's mom came over the other night and she was saying she'd gone to this restaurant that had just opened and she said she had an incredible meal. I was like, really? Because I'm, all I'm seeing is Yelp stuff that it's terrible. And she says, first of all, I don't like Yelp. I only like travel, the travel advisor. And then I said, well, you better get on Yelp and put a good review on there or people aren't going to go. Yeah. And she, and she didn't even, but for me, I was like, if you enjoyed this, you need to help these guys out because it's not going to work for them if, you know, if, if, if there's 10 bad reviews, their business could be, Absolutely. you know, so yeah, the, that organic, I mean, so trying to get people, help her, help them kind of thing, you know, this 70 year old woman to go to Yelp and throw on a review so that they stay in business. You right. Know? And just bucking the trend of, you know, the solo mom being an app and kind of the technology aspect of it, just right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be in your restaurant, and we'll talk exactly about restaurants. We get four examples of how to use solo mo in specific industries later. Um, but just the fact that people are on their phone in the store, so you're mobile. If you are encouraging them to if you are encouraging them to them to them, maybe it's right then and there, maybe it's our code or whatever QR code or whatever it is. You already have the social you already have the social aspect check in and check the review and do the review. And um that's just gonna spread to so many people around that so many people around that how far it's a little better how far together, but it's going to your together and it's going to your friends and your friends using that. So you're influencing all three of those things without some of the traditional concepts of all this. Um um with with uh, that thought, actually, that thought actually um, is something um, that is something a marker for me. I kind of I kind of frowns well, and I'm really glad you said to go do it. Do it, do it do good review. But I will say, I will say, in more personal drive, I am upset, I'm upset with Google, Google with, the with the amount amount, of amount that they're putting on generated content and reviews. Simply because most people who who place reviews are there to you know very very kind of time to want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. And I've gone to travel to build a beautiful business. I have good food, and just because I have. Some of those general people, people, people that it's oftentimes you just can never make happy. Right. And, and then, then they, they can shut my own business down, even though really I had good food, like your mom right. said. And so right. I feel that uh, there is a little bit of work on the Google end to better understand, you know, is this business being, you know, what is the, in a way, the Uber model? 
yeah. where they get to rate you in return. Right. You know, that's kind of one of the one-sided restaurant things. Like, I'd love to rate my uh, tenant and say, you know, they were difficult on yeah. this, that, and the other, and I went above and beyond, and they still just weren't happy. And so how do you do that kind of thing? I think it's interesting because there will, every, a couple times a year, there will always be some viral story of, you know, a bakery just fighting back against a bad review yeah, yeah. or a restaurant saying, you know, like, we told you not to bring your kids. or And, you know, they're always – and so who knows? I mean, these days you never know if things are done organically <laughs> or, or if, you know, if it's right. something that, you know, you say something strongly enough, it's going to go viral. And who even knows what viral is anymore and how many shares that requires or, you know, but it's – it's interesting to, I mean, you make an excellent point there. Sure. Um, and so one of the other things just really quickly about the social aspect of this and the technology that has come along with it is the hyperlocal targeting. Um, social with its, you know, location always on concept is pinpointing you to, you know, the exact, you know, feet in which you are standing. I mean, it's it's pretty dead on, whereas before we were using more geographical radiuses, neighborhoods, zip codes, things like that. Uh, and then the last is just most of social media um, channels are offering direct app downloads. Mm -hmm. And so where you really do want to get them into your own app so you can push some of those notifications, things of that nature, social media has identified that themselves and are helping to help you go mobile. Right. Uh, the next part of it is the low and uh, the location aspect of solo mo. Um, but uh, again, there's just a lot of things that are occurring, and there's new technologies with different beacons and things. I mean, we all know that our cell phones are always pinging uh, a satellite at all time, which is always giving a location signal. And for most of us, our locations are turned on because we get that nice little notification saying it won't work as well if we don't. And right. Whether that's true or not, who really knows? But, uh, you know, a lot of them, like the Yelp and Groupon, really do want to know how close you are so that they can sell them. Uh, provide you with the most relevant offers. Right. Um, but some of the ways that they're doing that is some definitely new and cool technology. And one of them are just beacons. And so beacons are uh, can be physical things. And so it can literally be a device that is kind of like an antenna. And it sits within your location. And when a telephone is within its range that has specific cookies or an app on it that is um, actually, you know, corresponding, then it will be able to identify that person has now walked into your store. Uh, you can do the same thing using geotargeting, which again is just a signal from the, uh, your phone. You can do uh, RFIE, um, and there's other mobile signals. Pretty much, we all know that our phones are always pinging, and there's always you know, an IP address or a computer pinging a location at all times, and so uh, that has really increased our ability to do location-based marketing. Um, and then just connecting the digital footprint with revenue metrics from non-digital purchases, these new beacons and things of that nature are allowing us to say, if you got cookied on a uh, social ad that you clicked on, you are actually, and your device ID has been stored, when that device ID actually walks into the store, that records a conversion. And that's something we haven't been able to do. Most of the time, for brick and mortar stores, you, all your digital advertising the revenue is lost the moment they walk in the store. You're not really sure. So you're hoping you're kind of more gauging, like, are we getting feet into the door? And that's about the end of it, mm -hmm. unless we have a salesperson asking them, how did you hear about us, things of that nature, which always break down and obviously inefficient. Right. Um, the last one, people buy within three-mile radius of their home. Uh, the location-based aspect is just catch people where they are, um, when they are, so we don't want to do the uh, spray and pray method, but when we walk into a specific zone. So if your product's only based in, say, Farmington in Utah, you know, what good is it to actually be delivering ads to people in Salt Lake? Those are wasted impressions and wasted budget. Right. So now we can actually just make sure those ads only <coughs> pop up during a uh, period when you could walk into our store. Right. Um, and then apps are a critical component for delivering the location information. Again, just because of the settings on it, you're more or less giving them permission um, to monitor your location at all times, and that's kind of something that's new with the technologies. Uh, the last part, mobile marketing strategy. Um, I don't know if you want to talk to a couple of these or just mention, you know, some of the observations of where mobile has gone. Um, I mean, like I said earlier, for us, you know, we've been radio for a long time, and obviously we've had, you know, our website for, for a long time as well, and I think just in the last few years have we taken the time to um, 
to understand, you know, our demographic is changing as well. It's we're, we skew older, you know, I think if a lot of our listeners heard what you just said about pinging everywhere they went, they'd be terrified and turn their phone Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but we also, you know, the fact that we have as many people as we do um, go into the app every month and, and really getting their news, not even just podcasting, you know, we do have a lot of podcast downloads from there, but going and getting their news from the app and using it that way um, just goes to show that it's, that, that we have had to make changes, but being able to offer that as um, as an advertising resource for our, for our customers as well has been has been really great. So I mean, we're seeing, and you know, more changes will be coming with that as well as as more people use it exclusively, mm-hmm. and that's it's happening, and and it will continue to happen. Again, you know, we're we're working as hard for that millennial. Um, part of the pie as, as anybody else is. Sure, sure. So. Um, and I think that's actually a great point. And uh, one of the things I would add to that is uh, as far as customers listening, when you think of the solo mo concept and having your own app, you think of it differently in the fact that KUER uh, specifically has a very targeted demographic. Right. Right. They've done the work, they built the app, and now all you have to do is put the ad within it. Right. And so in a way where you might have apps like Facebook or some of the more broad generic ones, sure. um, you might actually be wasting impressions again where you're trying to reach too many people who don't fit. And so in this audience where it might be a little older, maybe a little bit more affluent, mm-hmm. do you have that perfect product? And if you are looking to expand within your city, no, what better thing than public radio and right. some of the app stuff that you could be using? Well, in our, you know, you had asked earlier if we wanted a Facebook Live this, and, and I didn't because, you know, KUER, our Facebook Live is for election night coverage or for specific stories that we're covering, that sort of thing. And so, you know, we want we want our Facebook to be also a source for the news as opposed to, but, I mean, I think there's a slide up coming, you know, where on our Instagram, you know, when we have people work with us, we'll we'll do posts for the different for the different companies that we that, that work with us okay. and do um, do some advertising with us or or um, have a spot. But it's you know we've got we've got a few different ways that we can use that app and then use our social media um, and you know again we might do it differently, but that local aspect is hugely important to us because our 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 listeners are really um, dedicated to the to the companies that work with us and, and advertise with us. So. And so, do you guys, for the social stuff, do you do organic posts for them mentioning something, or yeah? And then do you boost that to a demographic of their own or something wide, or do you boost it all? Yeah, I mean, it it depends on. I mean, the the slide that's up here is you know we we posted the flowers that Hutter Flora did for us for right. an event of the weekend, and they were really appreciative that we had put them, you know, because. Obviously, the people who follow them are on Instagram are different than the people that follow us on Instagram and the mm-hmm. people who are, right. you know, paying attention. And so it gives them a chance to get out there beyond just their own, beyond what they do for themselves. So, and we'll get we'll get into that specific case study here sure. in a minute. Um, I, as far as how this kind of just applies to everybody, is one of the reasons we wanted to do this webinar specifically now is we had done traditional last month, and really we're just talking about the misnomers of traditional, that it doesn't really work. It's, you know, antiquated, all these different things. Um, And I really think when you say, hey, what do you think about advertising on Fox 13? What do you think? You're like, oh, I don't really want to do a local television ad or something like that. Well, Fox 13 also has the largest uh, social audience in all, uh, you know, the television stations. And so uh, when you kind of say that, there's so many different touch points, and then Fox 13 is obviously your local station. So it's all local, but it's across social. It's hitting people's mobile. They're listening on all these different devices. And even to the concept of people watching the local news are most oftentimes also doing something on their phone. So you can be actually hitting them in both places all while they're sitting in the comfort of their home. So um, a couple of things I just wanted to touch on here uh, that um, apps account for 89% of mobile media time within um, the only, uh, excuse me, the other 11% is spent on websites. And so most people use their phones to access an app. And um, for whatever reason, I feel like that doesn't 
translate well to people. Um, but if you really just kind of step back and think about it, most of the time you're in your Facebook app, you're in a LinkedIn app, you're in some type of, those are all apps. And yeah. so we, I think because Facebook, at least maybe I'm an older person and I, I only use Facebook on a desktop, when I think Facebook, I think website. Um, and so I think you do have to get your head into the mindset that Facebook's actually an app on a phone. Even right. You're still going to the page. Well, and I, and I think I'm, I also am older, but I use Facebook almost primarily on my phone. Like, I'm, I've gotten so used to just using it on my phone. So I would say, I mean, I know on my Verizon it will show me where I spent mm -hmm. all of my time. And, mm -hmm. and that stat was correct. I mean, 80% of it is, is on social media. Because yeah. I'm the same way. Like, if I'm going to go to a new site, I'm on my desktop. I mean, I, I mean, I do get some news from from Facebook, but I'm I'm desktop doing doing that sort of thing. But but this people saying they use their smartphone for email more than making phone calls. I I would say texting yes, email like I hate sending emails from my phone. <laughs> but again, dinosaur. So sure. And then the last one is just uh, the stat. Google says 61% of users are unlikely to return to a mobile website they had trouble accessing and 40% visit a competitor's site instead. Um, I bring this up because of the importance. This whole concept breaks down if you do not have a mobile friendly site and or an app. Right. Um, but we really do need to work towards that at this period in time. Um, I would say that most people that are kind of a local retail or um, some type of a vendor, automotive, your majority of your traffic, if you looked in analytics, I'm betting probably skews mobile device over desktop. And mm -hmm. so if you haven't made that transition yet, think how far behind you are and think that your consumer is just going to go to the next person where they can order online via an app or just the website. They can, uh, you know, make deliveries. They can um, pay bills. They can do all of these different things without having to actually go anywhere and how much easier that is um, to use than if you always have to go to a desktop. Well, but also making sure that if you do decide to go that route that you've done it well. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's it's not worth having an app that doesn't work because I'll tell you what, if I download stuff that doesn't work, I'm not re-downloading it. Right. No matter how many times you tell me you fix it. Well, I think the stat is something like 80% of apps are uh, downloaded and used once and never opened again. So, yeah. I mean, if it's not good and it doesn't work, then they're also not going to, I mean, put a lot of money into something there. And if your six-year-old six downloaded it, you delete it immediately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I learned. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so quickly, let's talk a little bit about what types of companies should use SoloMo. Um, first, I would argue I think every company really has an aspect as long as you're trying to make sales within, you know, your local area, which pretty much every B2B company wants to do, every B2C company wants to do. But in the example of Solomo, it really does skew towards some specific industries. And so here are just a few, but automotive, education, uh, restaurants and food, um, banks, hospitality, and events are about um, some of the ones that really use it and use it the best. And you can kind of understand why. It's, they're so brick and mortar. You're coming into the locations all the time. They're contingent on reviews and users saying how good this was and spreading the word. And so a lot of it is reputation-based with the aspect that a user has to come to you. Kind of right. thing. So um, those are a few of the industries. If you're in them, um, kind of just red flag this is something. If you're not doing now, you really might want to look into um, ASAP. And then quickly, how the mobile evens the playing field. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the traditional channels mm -hmm. and show how uh, the new technology and the advent of the phone and the way that we are using it has made it so that these traditional uh, advertising units are catching up with the advantages digital with my ones have. And it really all centers around the trackability of, you know, can we figure out the ROI? And that's why so many people went to digital is because they could say, if I give you this much budget, I'm getting this much back. And then the other side was, I have so much marketing going, but I don't really know what works, simply because I don't know what's driving people into my store. So, uh, we've kind of bridged that gap. And just a, a couple quick things, how television has done it. And so cable is one of the ways uh, that has really done a good job with this. But cable is getting to the point. They're not quite there. And if you were in our webinar last month, uh, you heard us kind of talking about what's coming. And soon and there's soon going, there's to, going be to be the ability, the ability for, for a television cable provider, provider who knows who you are, who are um, through your application, you identify, identify your household, household and then, then, then layering your party, party data, data you probably know how many kids you have, they know a lot about, about you. At which point, you are put into a bucket 
And right now, the way advertising on television works for the most part is that it's done by zip code or some type of digital um, region that they have set up, whether, you know, they, they have many different terms for how they call the way they have broken down the different areas. But uh, more or less zip code, point is it's not an individual house. So right now, a neighborhood all gets the same ad based on their current location. The future will, the future be, will be, they, they you'll actually, you'll get, actually get individual uh, commercial tailored to you and, you know, your demographic, your geo, everything about you, and that would be different than your neighbor right across the street. At the exact same time, you might be seeing two different commercials, and that can be done via uh, smart TV, um, you know, on your phone, on your tablet, um, any type of device now that is streaming uh, television. And so that's a huge difference maker when you can actually deliver that kind of uh, local advertising. Well, and I will say the companies that provide those services are, are trying really hard to be the first to do it because it's going to change for them the way, the way that people advertise and, and what they really, I mean, Again, if you know that you can that you can focus that specifically on your exact consumer, mm -hmm. it's. I went to a to a uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago and we talked about it. And it's. I mean, the, the future the future is now. <laughs> so. Yeah, and we're not saying you know you know this isn't happening now, but I think the point is you have 2017 coming up. You have budget considerations. You don't have to go you wait for cable to be able to do this right now. Um, but to the second bullet point, the, the video ad units have been rolled out across almost all sites. Do you do those in your app? We do. Yeah. So you've got you can do a full screen takeover so that every time and that's you know that's one of the considerations we're we're making is is if we move to a different streaming service, right now it's when you first log on and if we move to a different streaming service then like you know, on Pandora or some of the other stations, every time you switch a channel, you know, or you switch to a different story or you do something with an app, we can do that full screen takeover again. Yeah. So. And so, how many, um, I'm not sure if you noticed, do you know how many people are actually taking advantage of video within their uh, ad purchases with you guys? Not many. Right. I mean, we haven't, because, you know, we've been, again, we've kind of been so traditional for so long that it's taken us a little bit of time to figure out how to tell people mm -hmm. it works and how it can help them. And so we don't have a lot of it right now. But um, And we've actually, you know, for a little while we're doing it um, low, very low cost, but we're starting to see people. I mean, we've sold out all of our digital for the next three months, right. which for us is huge because, we, I mean, our customers are starting to see the benefit and so are we. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I, I kind of bring, bring that up to the whole 2017 thing. For the most part, video ad units outperform a static ad or banner ad pretty much 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it would really be down to creative and product, uh, and I shouldn't say 100% of the time, but it's fairly given that because of the way that they work, they are more engaging and they have a higher uh, engagement rate, I guess. Um, and what I've come across is we walk into businesses all the time from an agency and we're just praying they have a video asset of some kind that we can put on anything. And so when you're really looking into your 2017 budget, I would be putting aside some money for some type of video advertising. Mm -hmm. um, you can just take control of so many things and push everybody out when you can use that video. And so even while, you know, as Faith is saying, uh, some of the sites are kind of establishing how they're going to display it, at least you'll be ready, and when you're first to it, you just get that much more advantage. And also, to your point, I guess it's a little bit cheaper mm -hmm. at this point. The way, as soon as you get full going, it probably go up a little bit. Yeah. 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 So take advantage of it while you can. Learn if it's a good channel off the cheap. Um, the next one, and I'll let Pete uh, go ahead and address this. But how is radio kind of keeping up with this? Well, and I think I mean I've spoken to a lot of this throughout the conversation so far today. But um, you know, our social media presence that that we've really I mean we We've got our own marketing people that are that are keeping us up to date and keeping us out there and active and you know actively trying to get more followers because the, the more you can get your listeners to stay in tune with you, obviously you know the better it is for you and, and for your advertisers. So, and then again our, with local advertising, our listeners are incredibly loyal. They're 60% more likely to go to a business that they heard advertised on the station, and so um, and that's. You know, with with public radio, that is different than commercial radio. So, mm -hmm. uh, because we we limit the number of advertisements that we have 
you know, you can, I know for myself, I can, I can barely listen to commercial radio anymore because I have to change the station every time there's three minutes worth of ads, which is something we don't do. But, um, but the, I think that local aspect of it is what people really appreciate. Again, going back to how much we cover during, during the elections and, and, and all year, you know, we've actually hired three new reporters whose job is going to be reporting on local stuff because local is so important to people. It's, People really want to know what's going on in their communities, and so being able to give that to, you know, and really coming together with that idea that we're focused on the local and so are, are the people that advertise with us is huge. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And then again, the, the moving to the digital advertising in different formats, this is just the example I spoke of earlier, you know, our social media works you know, whether with our, whether it's actually side by side with our sponsors or if it's just something that we do for them organically, you know, these are gorgeous flowers that came up from Hutter Floral mm -hmm. for one of our, um, for one of our events this weekend. And, and so again, Hutter's really excited for the quote unquote free advertising and then, you know, you know it's just another channel for them. Right. Yeah, yep, and I think you kind of talked to it earlier that your audience is different than theirs, and so mm -hmm. how do you reach outside of what you already have um, on already established channels? Right. I mean, you guys have your following already pre-built. They just need to tap into it, and they've been able to do that both through local on the radio itself, you know, as you're driving, whether you're at home, on your computer, wherever you're listening to. Um, and then as soon as you hit uh, the social media, you get another one, and now you have the images kind of flowing in, which also makes that association. And it's so important in marketing to have touch points. Right. I love it when people will send somebody an email and then nobody calls them or does anything. And so <laughs> what happened? And it's like, well, when was the last time you responded to the very first time somebody had ever right. introduced them to you and you didn't just completely ignore them, you know? And right. so um, we really are missing this concept that people need to be nurtured. And they need to be made that they are cared about by your brand, and that they have a or your brand has a solution directly for them. Right. And so, in this example alone, I was thinking about this. The images themselves are all basically tagged to Hutter, mm -hmm. and so you've created an image resource for them. Right. Um, you've also just made it to your audience, and so they've reached their audience. You tag them, so you reach their actual owned audience, right. and then you capitalized on the local, local first. first. And so we have three audiences right there that you've reached, and then the fourth being the radio who may not engage with any of these. Right. Um, and so it's just it's amazing to me how many like solo mo really there's so many touch points just by doing one or two things and it can spread so easy as long as you use the right channels. Right. Anything else here? Um, and so I just also want to touch on that Billboard can do it too. Um, and this, again, is kind of a future technology. It's in the works as we speak. And so um, for the KUR listeners out there uh, who might be frightened by this, uh, <laughs> what, what is occurring is that billboards now will have uh, tracking beacons on them. And so in the past, the way that you would buy billboards is you would ask the billboard company to give you kind of neighborhood demographic data. And based off of that, you try to put up a billboard in that area so that you could capture the largest grouping of people who had your specific criteria. And based off of household income, we all know how neighborhoods kind of fall into specific uh, groups. And so that is only accurate to a point because we come and go from our house, but how many of us commute miles to work every day? And so that's not our neighborhood, but we pass it every single right. day. So now as you're passing, your phone is being um, identified by that billboard. And so when they're giving you new stats, they are actually giving you real-time stats of the profile people who are passing, how many times they're passing, and you know they can layer third party. So now you're getting the titles of these people, you're getting their age demographic well beyond the neighborhood itself. And so something that might be 10 miles away from your neighborhood may have your demo going back and forth because maybe there's a major business out there that happens to be drawing those people and you would never have chosen that location prior because that neighborhood itself didn't fit your demo. And so billboards are definitely about to get here and this is, you know, it's future state, but it's not long future state. That's so, amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't know. So if you guys don't know, I mean, for all of those out there not knowing if you're being tracked, uh, just turn your phone off, smash it with a hammer, right, and go, yeah. go under a hole. Go back to tracked. pay phones. Uh, time. I mean, if you guys have a car, 
that has a Wi-Fi in it, what do you think your car is sending to right. the dealer, sending to your manufacturer? I mean, it's pretty hard to get away with when you have engine trouble to say, oh, I got my oil changed regularly. Right. Uh, there's a computer in there telling you that you didn't. <laughs> and so everything tracks everything you do now. It's kind of just the way it's going. When the Russians hack your car. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> when they turn all the tests off all at once, we don't know. <laughs> Um, so just quickly, and we have about 15 more minutes here, and we'll uh, get to uh, a few minutes of Q&A, but we really wanted to just point out for all of you guys who have specific industries, um, how to use Solo Mo to pay, um, real world examples of just maximizing brands for social, local, and mobile audiences, not necessarily pertaining to the technology side of it, just so you guys can get a little feel of how you can use this. Um, so first off is automotive. Automotive is a, has a really great opportunity because the solo mall um, opportunity with the beacon mm -hmm. can do two things that are really uh, helpful to an automotive company or a dealership. And that is when, um, when automotive companies do digital, obviously you're coming in to buy a car. I, don't, I, I know that Tesla ships cars and they might be one of the few, but for the most part, most of us are not getting cars in the mail. We are going to a dealership, we are walking in, and we are driving out. And so that is really hard to track digitally. But in the automotive world, most all car searches at this point start with a uh, web search. Right. And so where, how do you connect those two? And the way to do it is to create a beacon. And a beacon is something that you can put on your site. And then as you do your different digital activities, it will recognize that somebody has been on a specific app. Maybe they have a cars.com app or something to that button. They'll recognize that it is on and that they would have seen an ad or had visited a page that was put out by your dealership and then can match them to you. And so when they walk in, it can actually send a notification to the individual um, that actually shows them a, a nearby sales rep who is available. So your sales reps can be on the system and they can all be available. And when the person walks in, it can say, hey, here is your sales rep, give them information about them, help them ask the front desk who they need to talk to, because maybe that person is the person who talked to them on the phone and said, yeah, we got that car, come on down. You don't want to recreate the will with that person. And so you tag that person's car with the salesperson and then give that person a mobile notification to go see that salesperson. On the flip side of it, you can take that data and you can send a notification to that sales rep saying the person has just walked in the door, so please go meet them at the door, helping diminish that time of confusion and or just people kind of looking around, make sure that they don't get lost on the lot and you can make the sell. And then again, you can attribute to actual dollars and cents. And so automotive is a really big one. Um, there are also additional ways to use it and I'll come to the geo-targeting. So for anybody automotive out there, um, geo-targeting other dealerships in your area is a great way to use a mobile device to capture, hey, if you saw, um, if you're at that dealership, why don't you swing on by, you know, it's only two miles, and again, you're using their location, their mobile, and probably a social app to deliver that ad. Right. And if uh, you look around, maybe just pay attention as people are sitting in the chairs, um, especially making those final deals in that negotiation stage, probably one person doing the negotiation, every time the person leaves the room, they probably hop on their phone for some reason or another, probably check your prices, check on their inventory. So uh, they're definitely being active uh, on the phone in your store and other of your competitors' stores as well. Yeah. Uh, the next is just banking. So banking also has a couple of advantages. And ba banking is um, unique in its own way too because so many people are logging in. Uh, I mean, most of us use our uh, mobile banking platform to log in and do our balances and make transfers and, you know, do all the different things that online banking offers nowadays. I only go to the bank if I have to. Right. I mean, <laughs> twice a year. Yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> so. And so, uh, and, and that has also made it so most banks have an app. You right. know, you have your own mobile app that has the security issues. I mean, there's reasons that banks are investing in. So most have it. So for all of your banks, most of you probably already have this in place. When they walk into your location, you could actually be delivering them a notification about a new Visa card. Yep. You could be delivering them those upsells that you ask your tellers to be doing for you. And, you know, of course, they do a pretty good job, but they can't do it every single time. The other thing that they can't do, um, and 
I guess, uh, and I take that back. I mean, I know that uh, banking systems actually have alerts that will tell the teller, hey, this person's due for this, that, and the other. Um, but it, that's the same thing that the mobile app could do. And so they, they might just come into the ATM, you can send the notification, and that could push them from an ATM to a conversation with the person. They could push them just to make a phone call. It could, you know, remind them, hey, um, this month is pay for A's and your kids with you, so you know make sure to ask about getting your uh, kid money for their grades or something to that effect. And so, because of the uh, logins, you can do cross sells and upsells based on what products they've already sold. And so that's a big advantage for the banks. And then uh, the last is just the deep geo targeting. And similar to how I said it for automotive, banks do this with indirect applications. Where if you're sitting at a dealership. The dealer's going to send you a uh, sell you a loan, um, but dealers most of the time don't actually hold that loan, and they go through a preferred vendor. Well, you want to pop up as that preferred vendor as much as possible. So while people are sitting in that booth playing in their apps, you can deliver them an ad saying, "Hey, this is our loan percentage at this specific dealer because you're geo targeting." So you can do an ad unit that says that dealer's name in it and say, "This is our rate. Make sure you ask them." and or get your deal now and come in in two weeks and we'll refi it for you at a lower rate. Um, so there's a lot of ways that banks can also be using this concept. Any thoughts on that? That's creepy. Awesome. I mean, <laughs> no, it's, it's, and before I, you know, even ran down to the bottom of the slide, that, that was my first thought is, is anytime anyone goes into a, to an auto dealership, they should be getting stuff like this from a bank. I mean, there's, there's no reason for them to not notice things like that. So, yeah. I mean, that's a huge opportunity. I think you'll pray to homes. Oh, you yeah. know, Geo Target Pray to Homes. If you're there, I mean, get pre-qualified right now. P.S. There's a rep at booth two two two. Yeah. You know. Well, the pre I mean, for I mean, but for some of these local businesses, I mean, some of these design firms, some of these, you know, R.C. Willie. I mean, those are things that that yeah. you know, things like some of the smaller local um, furniture companies that maybe obviously aren't as big as R.C. Willie or aren't as big as Ethan Allen. They could be doing things like this to really grow their business that way. I mean, that's that wouldn't take really too much to do. Yeah. Um, next is just the email, um, or excuse me, email, the education and events. And I kind of combine the two. Uh, schools really have a an advantage with social local mobile, uh, mainly because of their demographic being right. younger. I mean, these are the people who are most mobile, who are most social, and are mostly buying local. They, mm -hmm. they are still kind of in your own little nest area, and maybe as you're um, getting older and whatnot, you're branching a little further out. But for the most part, the younger demographic stays pretty close to home uh, for the most part. So um, one of the examples we have for university audience is just to do events. And most of us do open houses. Uh, most schools, I mean, that's kind of the bread and butter is their different events, open houses, um, job fairs, things of that nature. And so, again, you can use a beacon where you could get the data to know, you know, what digital ads brought them to your open house and know that they're there. Uh, additionally, and more fun, you can uh, add like an uh, ad or something that might be an event map or do something that actually helps people engage in uh, your event even better. I've uh, read stories where conference centers are doing this. So mm -hmm. the moment you walk in, it pops up your itinerary. That gives you a map and basically gives you the list of top things that you need to do. And so it's actually sending you that direct notification rather than making you, you know, scan a QR code or type in a URL and get it that way. Um, you can do it just based off of the fact you just walked in. You can even do it down to not the conference center, but the conference booth. Right. So that when somebody walks into your booth, it pings you the name of their company and your sales rep can be seeing that. Notice if you're a current custom, prospected customer, or if you're somebody they don't even want to talk to, which helps them engage. Hey, uh, this is a high interest prospect. Um, am I busy talking to a guy who's just kind of inquiring and doesn't have power of purchase, and yet right next to him is standing somebody that I really need to talk to? I can, I can make, make those, those decisions and make sure I'm engaging with the right people. Well, and anytime, I think anytime you can give yourself people more information, mm -hmm. I mean, the more information you can arm them with, the better prepared they'll be and the more the more they can do, the more they think they can get done. They can, you know, maybe not close a sale, but at least move it two to three steps beyond where it would have been without having to drag that information out of someone. If they start on a basis of knowledge, they're so much further ahead of the game than right. than anybody else. So, you know, being able to to have this information could really, really change things for yourself, people. I always think of this as kind of the uh 
art of uh, the pickup artist, if you know what that is, but, uh, you know, people who can really make you feel at ease quickly, yeah. and the way that they do that, and great salespeople do it, is by, you know, identifying things about your clothes or interests, and they, they put you off guard almost instantaneously, even though it is, and so um, when they actually have information about your company and things, all those, uh, I guess, counter um, sells things that you're prepared to deliver to that person, make sure they stay off your back, they, they diffuse that so quickly, and before you know it, you're right in the palm of their hand, and that's, you know, just the benefit of closed deals. Uh, the last for the event type of stuff is the flip side, and is how you could actually have this as an offering to people who are setting up booths for you, right. and so if you want to make sure, um, or if you're a presenter and you want to make sure that people are coming to your booth, that could be an upsell package mm -hmm. from the school or the conference center to say, we're willing to put ads, you know, the moment somebody walks in and all you have to do is just pay a little bit more. And so it could be a moneymaker for the event uh, host and or just a way for the presenters to have that much more interest. And so it tells them, hey, I really do want to come to this because these are the advantages. So um, one other way for education. And the last one, and probably one of the most applicable of all, really, is just restaurant. Um, restaurants, again, we kind of talked about the early example of how uh, an instant review can really help you. Um, how to find my or Square, social media sites, Instagram, and interest. I mean, I can't tell you how many memes I've seen of people saying, stop sending me pictures of your food. Uh, <laughs> and, so we all know this is really happening. And yet, how many restaurants do I follow on Instagram? You know, yes. a lot. And uh, I follow a lot of food bloggers, and, you know, because I want to know what those people think. So. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like you are a reviewer, a reviewer, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, do you review at the moment after the meeting? Do you go home? What's kind of the cadence? Do you know? I'm more of an at in the moment kind of person. Otherwise, it won't get done. If I get home, then there's eight other directions for me to go. So I like to do it right when I'm there and, you know, talk about what's in front of me. I'm not a food picture taker. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I've ever posted a picture. Maybe something, something I made, but never at a restaurant. So, mm -hmm. but I do follow, you know, I follow a lot of local bloggers, and you know, I get a lot of information from them about, you know, where they're, um, where they're eating, and whether they like it or not. I think, I mean, it's one of those things too, though, where you kind of take it with a grain of salt, because I think a lot of times, because there aren't that many here that are that are kind of well known. They take it easy on people a mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. more than maybe they would have been sure. just you know, the local show that came out the street and had a bad experience, yeah. you know, so there is that, but yeah, no, I, um, I think restaurants are the number one, I mean, I, I absolutely see your point when it comes to bad reviews and good reviews and what kind of, what kind of stock we put in those, but I think there are so many different ways now, I mean, if I Facebook post about checking in at a restaurant and then having my friends ask me how it was, you know, mm -hmm that's kind of subverting Google in yeah. a way, you know, the, so the more, the more of that organic thing, you know, organically that real people can do is, you know, helpful. Absolutely. Um, and then kind of some of the ways or ads that you could be delivering is first, if you walk into the store, you can provide an upsell coupon. So, um, you know, getting them from just the hamburger to the full meal at right. a discount, but, you know, and I think anybody who owns a restaurant understands how it, um, those margins really make a huge difference and how they can actually give a little just to get you to that next level um, or get that dessert or that next item and how that just improves the bottom line. Sure. Um, and there's two ways to do it. It's kind of the walk-in coupon. You can also do the, um, you know, exit uh, review. So you are almost right then, and or on checkout, as in like, you know, did you pay the bill, and now you've gotten a notification, that kind of thing, this, this table is closed. Um, and again, based on the fact that we can pretty much put you into a table rather than put you into a restaurant. And so um, by just zoning things, you really can get that granular in your data. Um, and then the last is just even sending a notification to say check-in. Did yeah. you forget to check-in right then? And you can go ahead and check-in. Um, I think the check-in alone would be a focus for me with restaurants. Sure. If I know my friends are at a restaurant, A, I'm upset they didn't call me and invite me, <laughs> but B, I kind of want to go because there's this weird, like, oh, you've been there recently, I want to go, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, and then just the last point is birds of a feather flock together. The more shares, everything we can do. I mean, for the most part, our friends are in a similar economic status. They live nearby, um, similar age. Um, and so for the most part, when we post something, we're posting to 
our audience, which is then your audience, because if I'm there, my friends probably want to be there as well. And so right. just the general importance of getting that user uh, generated content. And I want to also say, uh, I just disagree with the algorithm of Google okay. being about user generated. I don't disagree with the fact I think we should really focus on getting user generated traffic. Okay. I just think that reviews themselves, when they affect uh, organic results, um, are a little bit hard. Um, I think that if you have the ability to get number one in the organic results, then you can read the reviews and decide if you want to go, but you should punish the company um, because the reviews are one. You know, maybe they didn't really do anything and in the back end they have a beautiful site, they have great food. It's just there's a lot of things that go on, so I, I question Google, but they're Google and I'm me, so <laughs> probably not who's right about all that. Um, so that's kind of the end of it. I hope you guys have learned at least a few things about some of the industries and how you can do it. I think the broader thing that I wanted everybody to learn is just to really start wrapping their head about how everybody is on social. I mean, it's literally, we gave you the stats, it's four out of every five people is mostly using their phone for social media. And so every time I hear this, oh, my client's not, or my customer's not on um, social media, I just kind of sit there and wonder, like, really? Because I'm pretty sure that if one in seven people in the world are, then one of your clients also is. And we use them for so many different reasons. We always think, oh, business, business, business. But the fact that we're on them gives us a touch point to put our brand in front of them, even if we're not trying to sell directly that. And what I mean by that is if I see your brand consistently, when I do finally see your brand in a sales-oriented way, I will give it more credit because I know what it is, rather than if it's something new, I will disregard it. Right. Um, new technologies, obviously, are just allowing the attribution of this to come. This will continue to approve, and I think Solo Mo may be something that kind of revives um, after it kind of has dropped in the last three or so years. Um, I think considering your demographic behavior, uh, a mother of three doesn't use their phone the same way a college student would. Yeah. So what is your strategy and do you have different audiences? Are, you know, for the radio, maybe you can even talk to that real quick. Are you guys doing different things to capture that millennial audience versus um, what is more your traditional audience? Well, I mean, the fact that our digital aspect is, is growing so much, I think, speaks to that. Already, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, we're, we're bringing in we're bringing in different advertisers for that millennial audience. Um, but I think for us, it's just a matter of them even learning about us because a lot of you know a lot of younger people, unless you grew up with public radio, a lot of people don't even know it exists. Yeah. So trying to get out there and doing things at Craft Lake City and you know moving into these environments where we can where we can be seen by those folks and then capitalizing on on those sorts of things. You know, the fact that we're associated with the University of Utah is helpful as well. But Yeah. Well, you know, that's even a, a great uh, thing that you mentioned. The fact that if we were to, you were to be, um, you know, at Craft Lake City, but your goal is to get those people to advertise for you, right? Mm -hmm. And so when they walk in as a booth presenter, right. they could be getting a welcome packet from you uh, or a notification saying, you know, welcome to Craft Lake City. We support you Media in this way. Yeah. And yes, yeah, come to our booth. We'll give you a free, you know, 15 second air shout out or something sure. and come learn about. And, you know, I just made that up. I don't think they're offering that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, what I mean? Like even Absolutely. how you could just use this in those conference settings where you know your audience has uh, swelled in a specific area. Sure. Um, and then the last is just think outside of the box. Um, I think there's so many ways that you can do it. I don't think that you have to have uh, interconnected, you know, your app on your phone um, with geo-targeting all set up. I think that you can just even like for so many of us miss on our social media to send people to like a location. So have, when was the last time on Facebook you actually posted your address? I think you'd be amazed if you're a restaurant and somebody's near you, if you were to actually say, hey, come in for this deal and then provide the address in that same post, that address on a mobile phone becomes clickable. And so it's like click for direction. Yeah. And now I'm going there. Rather than I do, you know, face it's easy, but then I have to look and say about page and get the address that way. Yeah. You know, we're just not even putting in our own posts like, hey, and here's how you connect directly to my page, and here's how I launch your direction or your maps app. I think we're so used to getting exactly what we want when we want it. I'm the same. If I can't click on an address to figure out where I'm going or how I'm doing it, I just don't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, it's an excellent point because I know 
And if I feel that way at 40, I can only <laughs> imagine how a 19 or 20 year old feels about those sorts of things. Yep. So they're moving on, going to your competitors. So anyway, we hope we have given you guys a uh, few um, good uh, tips on how to use solo mo. We're going to turn it over to you guys and go ahead and answer a few questions. Um, give us just one second and we'll get all that set up. So um, bear with us one moment. Okay. Um, so just quickly, our first question, um, how big of an audience can we target to locally? Um, that's a pretty specific question. Uh, I don't know, is that, do you have any uh, restrictions on size or anything like that? No, I mean, it's, I mean, I guess it depends on what your audience is. I mean, I'm speaking with someone this morning who wants to target, who wants to target 65 plus, you know, so I can target a really large audience of 65 plus, um, you know, so it just depends for me how big or what exactly your target is, because you have to know what to target in order to, to do that, so. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say on that, that is kind of a, a little big of a question, but um, in some cases, some of the social channels do have requirements. So, like, you have to have a large enough audience on LinkedIn to actually serve ads to them. So, if you are doing a paid ad, uh, I believe that you have to have a threshold of at least a thousand individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in some cases, you will have restrictions, but I think it's more based on the channel itself. And then, I think it also has a consideration of budget versus potential. And so, if I'm at a conference and it's, you know, full of my potential candidates, it may not be a very big thing, but I know everybody there is somebody that I want, so I might exactly. focus on that. But if I choose a really small area and it's more like transient traffic, people walking by, and still there's not a lot of them, I might not put in all the energy to create a campaign where I deliver a lot of ads to people who may or may not be applicable. So I think when you're thinking about size, you really think about what is going to be the return, and is it even worth the setup of making your marketing team create one of these campaigns for that many uh, you know, potential prospects, or is another channel maybe a better choice for you? Um, our next question is, what is the most important aspect of mobile? Um, and I, I think I have an answer for that. I don't know if you want. Go ahead. Um, so <clears throat> for me, I find this to be the single most missed thing on mobile, the fact that people want to find your address and they want to call you. Um, the, the concept of the mobile device has really changed the idea of phone calls. Mm -hmm. And so for we used to be in a place where we wanted to submit forms. We wanted to be digitally invisible to pretty much everything. And um, the real reason for that is we just didn't want people contacting us. You know, right. sales was inhibited to us and we just didn't want to go through it. But now we're on the move and we want things right now, instantaneously. We want answers right now. We're in a car and we can no longer fill out a form. We need that answer. And so if I go to a site, while using my mobile device, I'm primarily looking for to do one of two things, call that company or get the directions because that's what I'm trying to do. So for me, that's always the single most important thing. If your phone number doesn't have a click to call, and you can test that pretty easy by going to your website and looking at the phone number, and if you can't touch it, then uh, you've got something wrong, and that's the area I focus on. And I, would, I mean, I would agree with that completely. I, I think you shouldn't have to click on contact me to get someone's contact information if you're a small local business, it should be right there in the middle of the page where people can see it because you're absolutely right. That's what they're trying to do is, is if they've gone to your if they've gone to your app then they're looking to see you. Absolutely. The second thing I would say what aspect of mobile is most important is the fact that you have something for mobile. I mean, Faith talked really about make it an app, but make it work. Um, make have a website, but make it have a mobile responsive version. If you don't have these things and they're not done well, that's probably the most important aspect is the fact that mobile works. And okay. if yours doesn't, then let's start there. Yeah. Um, the next question is, uh, does my business need an app? Um, you know, Faith, you kind of touched on that. Maybe you could just go into what made you guys start the conversation about having an app and then ultimately what pushed you over the edge to actually getting the app? Well, I think the fact that people were asking us if we had an app. I mean, really, it comes down to if if nobody's ever asked you if you have an app, you may not need one. I mean, if you're 
it's if you're raised auto repair, maybe you don't need one. Maybe you just need a, a good mobile website. But I mean, for us, where people were asking us for for something that they could use on their own because it was important to them, them. That, 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 that's what helped, helped us make a change. And then and obviously, obviously recognizing that there were, you know, there are a lot of other stations out there. They were capitalizing on that digital revenue as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and the ability to, to, you know, speak to our customers in a different way. You know, if, but, I mean, I would start there. If, if people aren't asking for it, that's one clue. I mean, and you could, if you have a good relationship with some of your customers, you know, talk to them about what they would want or what they would use it for. You know, what what would your customers, what would you create and what would they use it for? Mm -hmm. So I think that's just the perfect answer. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, our first question, how do I keep up with the changes in mobile advertising or marketing? Uh, you've been kind of, uh, you kind of coming into the underwriting position. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that you were keeping up in the past with? And if so, how or what's changed? You know, I, you I really wasn't. I've, I've always been, um, kind of direct sales working for people. I've never really had to deal with, with this, that sort of thing. So I, I would have a hard time speaking to how to, I mean, in my, if, if I were to think about it, I would say using someone like you and have, making sure you have someone on your side or a good marketing person who works for you that is staying up to date with those things. And, you know, I think you have to, I think you have to be, it's kind of a double-edged sword, like you don't want to jump to the very next thing just because it's new, but you also don't want to be wary of changes either. So it's kind of a rock and a hard spot, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think that you're really right about that because so many people want to jump. You know, what usually happens in, as an agency we see a lot is we'll have an owner coming to us wanting a specific product, most of the time because they have a employees who are telling them this is the next big thing, but do those employees really know the impact or the overall branding, and so do you need to just jump head first because it's the newest, greatest thing? I would say solo mo in general was something that that kind of occurred to, and those companies failed at it. I yeah. mean, solo mo kind of died, it really did, in at least its technology and its original format, and hasn't really been something that's evolved to the point we really expected it to, really thought that it would be this major thing that uh, companies were adopting and talking about, and I would say it's a term I rarely hear about, if ever. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, you know, being conscious of what you need to do. The other aspect is, uh, and I appreciate the, um, uh, you're passing it back to us there, Faith, but uh, agencies really do do a good job, and this is my consideration, because we get this question on almost every webinar, but um, agencies' jobs are to know this stuff and to do it, and I don't believe that businesses' jobs is that. And so I think what you have to do is weigh, what does it take to actually stay up to date with these changes um, versus just hiring people who that Who's that is their actual job. Sure. And so really weighing um, how important is it for you to be how up to date with it. I mean, I think you should always be reading and engaging in the forums right. and blogs. And again, agencies, if you go to their blogs, are usually pumping this kind of content out. Um, but as far as you really being an expert in it all the time, unless your basic your business is running, you know, a large percentage of sales off of a mobile device, you may or may not need to know it yeah. in and out. Um, but I would have a general understanding of it. And of that, go to the sites, you know, um, just type in some of the terms we talked about. I, I tell everybody, I mean, Google is the best university that there is. So sure. if you ever have a question, you know where to ask. <laughs> uh, let's quickly just take our last question. Um, and the last question is, do I need to make uh, separate ads for mobile? Uh, you're kind of in the underwriting space and dealing with what are you telling people yes. as far as trade <laughs> Yes, you do. Um, and it can be frustrating for the people who are creating the ad because Samsung has different requirements than iPhone has different requirements for, you know, desktop. So yes, you do have to, I mean, it's it's not difficult, but yeah, one size does not fit all when it comes um, to the different platforms. So. Absolutely. Uh, and as an agency, we completely agree. Uh, and I also come back to what is the aspect of mobile you want to focus on? And so in, is that an ad with a phone number? I mean, what good is a phone number on a desktop for you uh, if it's in your ad? Because most people aren't going to click that or anything like that. Um, or, you know, the address for things that say near you, things like that on a desktop aren't, aren't as good as an ad as if you that pops up on your mobile and it says right near you, a few miles away. from you. You know, can you do this dynamically, which yeah. you can. 
And so, yeah, absolutely, it's more relevant. Well, and I, just from my experience and, you know, just from radio, and if you've ever heard an ad on our station, and we do do things differently, but we, we never give phone numbers. We always give websites because we want to draw. We want anyone listening to our underwriters, listening to our underwriting spots, to go straight to the website because a phone number, when was the last time you wrote down a phone number? I mean, we're talking about how upset we are that we can't click, <laughs> you know, click the link to the phone number, let alone wrote it down off of the radio. So that I think that's just kind of a broader version of what what you need and, and how things, you know, what it what it needs to look like. So great. Well, guys, that's uh, our last question, and uh, we're about at time. So I just want to thank everybody for attending and for listening to uh, this month's Fluid Webinar Series uh, events. Um, we will be back next month, uh, third Tuesday at 11.30 a.m. as usual. If anything changes, we will let you know. But uh, in the meantime, as if you want to contact either of us, you can um, use the hashtag Fluid Webinar Series. Uh, you can do our handle at Get Fluid, and it looks like we need to replace this yep. one. Tell us yours one more time. At Faith Alder. And spell that F A E T H Alder, A L D E R. Fantastic. Well, Faith, thank you so much for My coming pleasure. in today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.